medical history and medical advancement throughout history is a very interesting story. Very interesting story that would not have happened if it weren't for the more interesting and more macabre history of anatomical dissections of human bodies. This story brings us back to 3rd century Alexandria, under the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty, culture, art, and most importantly, learning took hold in that Hellenistic world. Famously, the Great Library of Alexandria housed within its walls scrolls of knowledge still unknown to the modern world. Within that library was the Library of Medicine, where all the medical practices of the day were curated, collected, and categorized into a vast collection of information. One of these medical practices was the taboo process of opening dead human bodies for observation, pioneered by two Greek philosophers, Aristotratus of Sios and Herophilus of Chalcedon, these men made observations about human anatomy, mostly on executed criminals, then wrote down and drew what they saw. Their writings would barely survive throughout Greek and Roman history, even after the practice died out due to it not being the most well-loved of sciences. This led to a period in anatomical history where most of the knowledge about the human body was guesswork based on myths and legends, with this information mostly being what was passed down to future generations, whilst the writings of Aristotratus and Herophilus were lost to the sands of time. Finally, Christianity came to the Greco-Roman world. And that was the final nail in the coffin for the early history of dissections in the Hellenistic world. In 389, a massive riot, which was part of an enormous series of conflicts in Egypt over religion, which I will not get into right now, resulted in a fire that burnt down what remained of the Library of Alexandria, where the Library of Medicine had been located over the years, destroying the knowledge within forever. Although the practice of dissection had died out in the Greek world, it lived for a little longer in the Roman world. The Roman physician Galen was very famous for his experiments done on different animals to learn about their physiology and anatomy. His writings would survive throughout the Middle Ages and would be later expanded upon by scholars, and would even serve as a tool to teach anatomy to surgeons and other practitioners. However, dissections on human cadavers were completely forbidden by the Catholic Church which would crush any further investigation into anatomy and drive the understanding of the human body into mythology and hearsay. Before I move on to the return of dissections in Europe, I want to talk about the rest of the world. First up, India, where the process of dissections was in the medical world since its early history. Dissections were at their peak in the 7th and 8th centuries AD. However, its decline was just as fast as it rose, and the practice in India wouldn't return to the same levels until after the British took over in 1827. Next, the Islamic world, where observations about the human body were made. The Muslim physician Ibn al-Nafris created many diagrams of the human body, some of which were traded to Europeans, and finally Tibet, where the process of burial called sky burial would take place. Due to the mountainous terrain of the Tibetan plateau, the Tibetans couldn't bury their dead easily, so instead they had a tradition where a man would tear apart a person's body and leave it to the vultures. The practice gave them a lot of knowledge about human anatomy. This information would spread throughout most of Asia, especially to India, which would support scientific and medical learning of the day. Alright, back to Europe. The High Middle Ages were a time of great change in Europe. In 1095, one of these changes began, the Crusades. The Crusades were a long and complicated series of wars and conflicts that happened between 1095 all the way up until the end of the 17th century. The ones that we care about, though, are only the first, second, third, and fourth, because they established three important things. One, they established trade networks between the Italian city-states and the Muslim world. Two, they increased the wealth of said Italian city-states. And three, they sacked Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. The sacking of that once great city brought Eastern literature and art back to Italy. They brought new ideas that valued the classics of Roman Greece, and most importantly for our story, they brought dissections over from the East. This would start a chain of events that would begin in Paris in 1150, where a school of medicine was established that practiced dissections. Then in Boulogne in 1158, then Oxford in 1167, then Montpellier in 1181, then in Padua in 1222, all throughout Europe, medicine began to take on its archaic form. This all came to a head 
during the reign of Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II when dissections were legalized. However, this was only allowed to happen to one person, only one dissection, every five years. This practice eventually spread to the rest of Europe, with France, Poland, and especially the Italian city-states having the least restrictions on the practice. But change always has its reactionaries, and thus was the Catholic Church. In 1229, Pope Boniface VIII issued a papal bull, which is essentially a decree, called De Sepulturis, which forbade any manipulation of corpses and stopped the trade of bodies of soldiers killed in the Holy Wars. But the church wasn't in the best of positions to enforce this ruling, so they didn't, and no one cared, mostly due to this being a direct contradiction of the previous pope, Nicholas II, who had sanctioned dissections in Bologna in 1292. Due to this, Bologna would become the capital of anatomical research in the early Renaissance. The first officially sanctioned dissection of a human corpse would finally happen in 1315 by an important scholar named Mondino de Luzzi. This began the revival of dissections for teaching anatomy in Europe. Gone were the days of superstition and myth controlling anatomy. Now it was a science. However, as the practice grew up, a new practice evolved with it. Grave robbing for corpses. In 1319, the first recorded case of grave robbing for the purposes of stealing a body to dissect was perpetrated by a lecturer at Bologna University named Master Alberto. And yet, after all of this, the practices still grew. The cities of Perugia, Padua, and Florence would experience their first sanctioned dissections, and soon enough, the first dissection outside of Italy would happen in Vienna, Austria in 1404. Soon enough, this had spread to all of Europe, with major cities practicing their first sanctioned dissections as well. But this led for the need for bodies increasing tenfold, just as the number of people being executed went down. This led to a strange practice of students paying for families' dead loved ones, essentially by paying funeral costs as part of their tuition to get into university. Although these early dissections were used to teach anatomy. It was based on old information and nothing had been expanded upon, but this would all change in the early 1500s. Another real quick side note before we continue. The use of dissections in anatomy for painting was also very important to the Renaissance. Though most only examined cadavers to create new perspectives in art, some went as far as dissecting actual muscles to accurately betray human muscles. Now back to the story at hand. In 1543, science was aided by a young Italian scholar named Andreas Vesalius when he published the first detailed book on human anatomy, De Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septum. His depictions were so accurate, they became the basis for anatomy. Detailed descriptions, tons of drawings and diagrams, it was revered for its accuracy. The practice continued to teach when the first anatomical theaters were opened in European universities, Padua in 1594, Lyon in the Netherlands in 1598, Paris in 1604, the use of these structures would continue to spread all throughout Europe for the next 100 years. This brings us to the final part of our story, the history of dissections in the British Empire, who would eventually become the capital of medical advancement. Human cavideric dissection was prohibited in England until the 16th century. This could be due to the influence of the Catholic Church. Of course, this was before Henry VIII ended it when he broke away from Catholicism to form the Church of England. Most of England's anatomical knowledge was largely based on manuscripts from classical Greece and from medieval Italy, and also from the dissections of animals. In 1565, a selected group of physicians and surgeons from the Royal College of Physicians and the Company of Barber Surgeons were given permission to dissect a very limited number of humans. John Caius, an English physician who graduated from Cambridge and became a student of Versailles in Padua, was the president of the Royal College of Physicians from 1555 to 1560, and again between 1562 and 1571. It is generally acknowledged that he was the first one to popularize the study of practical anatomy by human dissection in England. At the same time, during the 16th century, dissections in England were performed on the corpses of hanged criminals, and hardly any of the bodies required for dissection were voluntarily donated for this purpose. However, by the onset of the 17th century, demand for human bodies for conducting dissections rose sharply, 
at the same time of printed books from Italy and France, where significant development had come from, were arriving in England. At this exact same time, English started to come up with their own original contributions to science, as the great English physician William Harvey, who had graduated from Padua and gotten his master's in Cambridge, had published a treaty named De Moto Cordis et Sanguinis, on the motion of the heart and blood in 1628, in which he documented his theory on circulation of blood, which was based on observations made during the course of dissecting several human bodies, including his own father and sister. This brings us to another point. As the need for bodies increased, Parliament passed the Murder Act in 1752, which served a dual purpose. It was originally aimed at preventing the horrid crime of murder, as it was associated with the apprehension of being dissected after being hung, and it also ensured a legal supply of fresh human cadavers for anatomical study. This law, however, would not be enough and soon enough a black market would open as the demand for bodies increased during the 1800s. An example of this was in 1828 when two Irishmen living in Edinburgh, William Burke and William Hare, murdered and sold the bodies of at least 16 men and women to Robert Knox as dissection material for his anatomy classes. Burke and Hare crafted a method of murder which became infamous as burking, smothering a victim after intoxicating him or her with alcohol, and it went completely undetected by the doctors whom they had sold their prey. Burke himself was ironically awarded capital punishment, and his corpse would be dissected. This and other similar events led to the passing of the Anatomy Act of 1832. This would prevent the black market from growing by ensuring a steady stream of bodies that would be available for dissection. This, however, would lead to a new issue, the poor and or homeless dying, and and then their unclaimed bodies being sent for dissection. This issue would take another 130 years to solve, but it wouldn't happen in England. It would happen across the ocean in the United States of America. The history of human dissection in the United States followed an almost identical path to that of Europe. Until the 18th century, the bodies of executed criminals served as the sole source of cadavers for anatomists in the United States. In 1790, a federal law was passed which permitted federal judges to add dissection to a death sentence for murder. At times, the threat of dissection was even used to discourage crimes such as dueling, which was disruptive to society. However, the demand for human cadavers was on the rise due to the beginning of the first formal course in anatomy at the University of Pennsylvania in 1745. Such conditions encouraged the practice of grave robbing. In response to the public outcry caused by this, New York passed legislation in 1789 to prevent the odious practice of grave robbing. However, the law did little to curtail the illegal practice as it offered no suggestion as to how medical schools might legally obtain the requisite corpses. Ultimately, Massachusetts became the first state to enact laws in 1830 and 1833 that allowed unclaimed bodies of people who had died in public institutions such as hospitals, asylums, and prisons to be used for anatomical dissection. The Massachusetts law stipulated that the unclaimed bodies of soldiers would not be dissected as they had already served the state during their lifetime. Over the course of the next few decades, many other states followed the example of Massachusetts and introduced similar legislations which successfully curtailed the practicality of grave robbing. Nevertheless, these legislations reaffirmed the association between dissection and destitution as both before and after these acts were introduced, it was the poor sections of society who were exploited the most. Soon, laws trying to prevent grave robbing had the knock-on effect of causing the supply of cadavers to decrease. One of these laws was Maine's Anatomy Act of 18. 69, which rested the final decision about the deposition of a body of an individual with the relatives. It acted as a bottleneck towards anatomical schools acquiring the bodies of those who had willfully donated their bodies prior to death. And ironically, thanks to the research done on cadavers, the supply of human cadavers to the medical schools was further worsened by the United States welfare legislation and better health care for the poor, leading to a sharp decline in the availability of unclaimed bodies between 1930 and 19. During the early 1960s, a confusing conglomeration of anatomy acts, common laws, and state statutes made body donation a legally complicated matter. Finally, 
the development of transplant surgeries and consequent rise in the demand for anatomical research led to the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, which is a very, very long and fun name to say, approved the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, the UAGA, in 1968. The UAGA was a turning point in terms of body donation as it established the human body as a property such that the donor's wish now superseded those of his next of kin in court. Within the next four years, the majority of states followed suit and enacted laws that were similar to the UAGA. A second act was signed in 1987, which served to clarify the donation process further. Together, these two acts, often referred to as the UAGA, were instrumental in standardizing and streamlining the process of body donation in the United States. This finally ended the problem of the poor being exploited. Finally, that brings us to the modern day, where you can donate your body to be dissected. Dissections are still carried out across all of the world. However, thanks to computer models and other such technologies, the need for human bodies has decreased considerably. And thanks to human dissections, medical advancement has made it to the modern day, where no longer is medicine based on myth and legend. It is based on science.